What Theresa May seems to be doing here is asking for a longer extension which she hopes not to use. I say seems because only Theresa May could do a statement to the nation that no one can quite work out. And I think the language here is opaque, reflecting the agony of that cabinet. Because what she's, I think, got past cabinet is what might be called a flex extension. She knows that the EU isn't up for just another little mini extension. And so she's asking, can we have an opt out early? Should I get lucky with my dealings with the opposition or trying to get stuff past Parliament? Look at the language uh, used here. She asks for a further extension as short as possible, which ends when we pass a deal. That does run a kind of coach and horses through the deal that she's already got on an extension. She is asking for more, absolutely no guarantee that the EU will lap this up. And then the other part of all of this is where she's saying she wants to sit down with the leader of the opposition. What are we? April the 2nd? I think Brexit Day was the 29th of March. She wants to sit down with him and agree a plan on how to move things forward. And if they can't agree a plan, Quite plausible, that, I think. Uh, she says that they will agree on some ideas that would go in front of uh, uh, MPs to have indicative votes. Now, they have been doing indicative votes, as you will have noticed, but she's now saying that she's going to back uh, a form of indicative votes and will abide by the outcome. And we know that any outcome, if there is an outcome, if there is a majority for anything, almost certainly means a softer Brexit. Just a word on the idea of talks with Jeremy Corbyn. She knows extremely well that this uh, will be something that he probably feels he has to turn up to, but really won't want to get too heavily involved in. If I've heard one phrase from shadow cabinet members more than any other when it comes to uh, Brexit, it is the Tories must own this, uh, followed by uh, a word like mess quite often, or sometimes uh, something a little bit more unpleasant. She also knows that Jeremy Corbyn has people on his back trying to get him uh, to go for a referendum. And so this will discomfort him. How genuine is she about the chances of seeking uh, cooperation with him? Well, we'll see. But as I say, it is April the 2nd, 2019. Here's how the day went here. Much of it spent waiting, waiting for that cabinet to end. Shortly after breakfast, they disappeared into number 10 for a cabinet meeting to crunch the government's options. At times, it seemed they might never be seen again. It would be more than seven hours before they emerged. While they were locked in, the EU's chief negotiator ratcheted up the pressure, saying there would be hefty conditions attached to any long extension to the Brexit delay that Britain might ask for. A strong justification, a strong justification would be needed. Many businesses in the EU warn us against the cost of extending uncertainty. There would also be a political cost. In any case, if the UK is still a member state on the 23rd of May, it will have to organise the European elections. The Irish Prime Minister visiting President Macron in Paris struck different tones. Mr Varadkar desperately wants to avoid a no-deal Brexit. France's president doesn't sound so sure. If the United Kingdom is not capable almost three years after the referendum of coming forward with a solution that is supported by a majority, it will have effectively chosen a no-deal exit on its own, and we cannot avoid that failure for them. While the Cabinet meeting dragged on and the stage was set for a prime ministerial statement, MPs of all parties tried to steer Theresa May away from an election or towards another referendum. Still, she is too scared to take on one faction or another faction in her own cabinet. And if she is not willing to take on her own cabinet in the interests of what is good for our country, then I am deeply worried about where we're going. Some people in Downing Street who think a general election might be the button to press. What do Tory MPs say about that privately? Uh, well, I'll tell you, they think they're mad. And the reason why they're mad is because it would be a deeply destabilising thing to do, not just for the party, but for the country. Everybody watching this will know that the Conservative Party over the last two years have been trying to achieve a major piece of policy. If we fail to do that and then go to the country, the country's not going to be, you know, full of love. Then, just under an hour ago, the Prime Minister gave this statement. I've just come from chairing seven hours of Cabinet meetings, focused on finding a route out of the current impasse. 
So we will need a further extension of Article 50, one that is as short as possible and which ends when we pass a deal. Today, I am taking action to break the logjam. I'm offering to sit down with the Leader of the Opposition and to try to agree a plan that we would both stick to to ensure that we leave the European Union and that we do so with a deal. However, if we cannot agree on a single unified approach, then we would instead agree a number of options for the future relationship that we could put to the House in a series of votes to determine which course to pursue. Crucially, the Government stands ready to abide by the decision of the House. But to make this process work, the Opposition would need to agree to this too. This is a decisive moment in the story of these islands, and it requires national unity to deliver the national interest. Having played her part in frustrating the last two attempts by MPs to ballot on alternatives to her Brexit plan, the Prime Minister now saying she will implement MPs' wishes if there's no Labour-Tory agreement. Last night's second print run of green ballot papers failed to produce an outright winner. In frustration, one of the main organisers said he'd had enough of the Conservative Party. My party refuses to compromise. I regret, therefore, to announce that I can no longer sit for this party. Oh, Nick. Nick, don't go. Come on. Honourable gentlemen, who's told the House? There were angry exchanges, too, in Labour and the Lib Dems aimed at colleagues some thought had refused to compromise and back rival approaches. And the MP with the most senior medical career in Parliament says she is approached more and more by MPs feeling sick with stress and strain. Some people talk about already even struggling to find the right words, their brains are moving slower. You know, exhaustion results, as we know, in poor decision making. Sleep deprivation results in poor decision making. So I think really this is not a healthy place at the moment. It's and a sick I'm, house. It, it really is. Theresa May's statement only adds to the stressful times ahead. Their seven hours of talks has produced a plan the EU may find difficult to swallow and which gives no certainty when so many crave it. With me now is the Government Minister Tobias Elwood. He's a, minister, a Defence Minister. Uh, and uh, if, I would like to ask, first of all, Tobias Elwood, I mean, this could have been done months and months ago. This had to be a bipartisan action. And yet she's blinded on on her own and got nowhere. You, you can't, I think, criticise any Prime Minister of the day trying to get their deal across the line. And we've tried many options there. It goes back to the original question as to what it means to leave. We all decided we wanted to leave the EU, but didn't say where we wanted to go. And so many individuals across the country and indeed Parliament have got their own purest view as to what Brexit means. We've had to reconcile that. Everybody's had to compromise somewhat. And we've explored different options, as you know, looking at the backstop, working with the DUP, and it hasn't got us anywhere. The country is calling us to say, solve this, get on with this. Parliament needs to act, and so the Prime Minister has stepped forward to say, let's do this. Let's try and find a unified approach with the Leader of the Opposition. If we fail that, as you heard, we then go to indicative votes, which will then count. But ultimately, we want a managed Brexit. We want to avoid no deal. We also want to avoid uh, European Union elections. Well, two and a half years of failure. And with 10 days no, to go, okay. 10 days to go, she begs to get the leader of the opposition to talk to her and help her out. So it isn't two and a half years. It's worth explaining. You know this better than most. There's two parts to this departure. The first is the withdrawal agreement. That did take about two years to put together all the details on how we actually depart to make yeah, sure we have managed. Yeah, but they should have done that together. It's the second, together. No, because the Labour has already agreed the withdrawal agreement. Keir Starmer's been on your programme to say, I haven't got a problem with the withdrawal agreement. It's the next phase. What is the future relationship? That's where the arguments come as to whether it should be involved a customs union or whether it should be whatever it might be. That's what Parliament's failed to actually agree, and that's what we do need to agree now. What the Prime Minister failed to understand was that this was never going to fit the paradigm of party politics, that her only option from the very outset was to look for the Europeans in the Parliament who were going to go the same direction that she wanted to take it. I recognise why you say that. The clock is still ticking. We're not there yet. 
we are looking at further options. The Prime Minister has been very clear today. Let's talk with uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Let's see where there goes. Let's then, if that doesn't work, then we go to the indicative approach. The important thing, though, is that there is a will on this side uh, of the channel to say, let's get this done in a managed way. And I understand the same is coming from Brussels as well, and that's good news. Whatever Mr Corbyn says, it all depends on Europe. Did, well, did, did she speak to them during this meeting? I'm afraid there's been a lot of political opportunism by Labour. I hope they will park that and do what is best for Britain. But we don't know what Europe's going to say to this. To what? To, well, the... to extending? Well, They'll only do it if they really believe there's a deal in the offing. Absolutely. And we, not, we must prove that. We must work hard so we can actually gain that and make sure we get it across the line before we reach the 22nd of May. If we don't do that, the, the other option is that we have an extension uh, and that takes us into European Union elections so far away from what the referendum was saying. That is not in Britain's interest. Let's get on with this. Tobias Elwood, thank you very much indeed for talking with us. And Yvette Cooper now joins us for, now from the central lobby. Labour, of course, and she's there in the Houses of Parliament. Uh, Yvette Cooper, what do you make of this? Do you think Mr Corbyn's going to rise to this particular challenge? Well, I think the Prime Minister is right to recognise now that she can't implement anything by April the 12th and we cannot have crashing out with no deal on the 12th. It would be hugely damaging. We understand the, the Cabinet Secretary, who is also the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister and to the Cabinet, told the Cabinet that no deal would make us less safe. So I think it would have been irresponsible for the Cabinet or the Prime Minister to come to any other conclusion today. I think we should welcome what the Prime Minister has said about wanting to now listen to Parliament to work cross-party and to come forward with indicative votes. But, of course, I think we'll have a, a whole series of questions about how this is going to work, about how this has to be different from previous discussions which, which just didn't really go anywhere and didn't happen at all. Well, few Labour MPs have worked as hard as you have on, on this issue and you must know something of Mr Corbyn's mind. I mean, a great deal hangs upon what his approach to this is going to be. I think it also a great deal depends on what the Prime Minister's approach is going to be. So you're absolutely right. The, I think the um, uh, Labour and the Conservatives do need to come together and to have these debates and to have these proper conversations. But bear in mind that, I mean, I've been in to have discussions with ministers before, been invited in just as Jeremy and the Keir and the uh, front bench team have been. And actually, there hasn't been any sense that, that there was listening before. So I really hope that there will be now because I've always said actually everybody needs to come together to try and find a sensible way through this. As long as everybody is just shouting at each other, frankly, the whole country will be tearing their hair out whether they voted leave or voted remain. They just see a mess. So well, I hope this will be a sign of, of a different kind of approach. But I do, as I said, still have a series of questions for the Prime Minister about how this is going to work. But you've got your own track going here. You've got your own idea of what to do uh, and what to, how to take control in Parliament. Does that all lapse? Do you now sit on your hands and wait for these people to sort it out at the top? Well, I think that's why there are some important questions. So we had uh, put forward a, a bill that would really call on the Prime Minister to come forward with a, with a plan, with a proposal, to make sure that we didn't leave with no deal on April the 12th. So just to make sure we don't have the hit to medicine supplies, to our manufacturing and so on. I think the, the questions to the Prime Minister I would have would be about what is the process going to be to decide the length of the extension that she's going to put forward. We could do with knowing that. But also, if the EU has a different response, they say something different in reply, how is she going to respond to that and what say will Parliament have on that as well? We also need to know how the indicative votes process is going to work. Right. So we'll look really carefully right. at the proposals and I hope that this is really moving in the right direction now because in the end there's too much at stake not to. Uh, Yvette Cooper, in one word, do you anticipate Mr Corbyn bringing you into his circle to help out on this crisis? I think that's got to be for him. He's got to decide. I think Keir Starmer is doing an excellent job. And I've had many conversations with Keir, with Jeremy, uh, with many members of the Shadow Cabinet. But, you know, they have their responsibilities as the members of the Shadow Cabinet. Uh, we also, obviously, whether it's as chairs of select committees, right. as backbenchers working together, will continue to do so and to work with them as well. Yvette Cooper, thank you very much indeed for joining us. More from Westminster later. But for now, let's go over to Matt in the studio. Thanks, John.
Well, a short time ago, the European Council President, Donald Tusk, gave his immediate response, tweeting, even if after today we don't know what the end result will be, let us be patient. Well, I'm joined now from Brussels by the Irish MEP, Mairead McGuinness, who's Vice President of the European Parliament. Uh, Mairead McGuinness, uh, it's wonderful to see you and that you've sorted out your Skype. Um, can you be patient? I mean, this offer today has come three days after Brexit was supposed to take place. Look, it's been a roller coaster day here in Brussels because much of the day was spent wor worrying and anticipating a no deal Brexit. And then we knew this uh, seven hour meeting was happening. And then this statement, and I have a copy here in my hand, but I need to dissect it. And I think the first thing to say is it, it is positive that the British Prime Minister is aware that a no deal Brexit is really bad for mm. the UK and for the European Union. I think her reaching across the House is, is, is welcome. Uh, and, of course, we'll have to see what the reaction will be to that approach, and I hope it, it is positive. Uh, I think the timings I'm a little bit concerned about, but mm. I'm going to try and, and get over those concerns and look at the pragmatism now. I know in previous interviews, uh, which I've just listened to, others were saying, look, why did this take so long to happen? Uh, we can have that analysis. I'm just glad it's happening now, and I hope it yields a good result. Uh, because I think that there was real concern, uh, given last week's vote, that the House of Commons, that the United Kingdom could not find a way out of this mess. Right. And I, I hope that this speech will help chart a course towards uh, a resolution and a ratification of the withdrawal but agreement. But there are also lots of known unknowns and lots of ifs. Um, do you think that, assuming that there is a meeting with Jeremy Corbyn and they come up with some sort of conclusion, that this will persuade the French especially to grant the longer extension that she will now seek at the summit next week? Well, I think the extension she's looking for is not that long, and that's what I'm concerned about, because at the moment it's April the 12th, so it's going beyond that. But as I understand it, the Prime Minister wants it to stop before the European election date. So, in other words, that the ratification and all that goes with it will be dealt with before then. I mean, as I as I speak and I think, because this is so it's so new and it's happening literally as we talk, um, the European Parliament will have to ratify a withdrawal agreement. And I'm just thinking about the mm. timings of that. We will be in election mode, in fact, the last day of the campaign. Uh, so there's all sorts of timing, legal uh, complications, but I think the political dimension is the most significant mm. one. And if the political uh, classes in the United Kingdom can come forward, work together to resolve this crisis, then I think we might be able to resolve the other issues, right. the, the, the legal uh, and the technical issues. So I do think we need to see what next happens. Well, but indeed. It is a new development. OK, well, we're about to hear from a, a leading member of the, you know, the, the Brexiteer side of the Tory party, and a lot of it hinges on them. If mm. there is a deal, do you think that Theresa May can actually be trusted to make it happen? Look, if there's a deal, there is one. Let me be clear. The deal is on the table. I think the question is, if it is ratified, uh, it seems to me ratification will rebuild if trust is broken, as it is slightly at the moment. I think it would give us all that sense of purpose that we have uh, sorted the withdrawal part of this discussion mm. and we're looking to the future. But I do think that her conversations with... Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the opposition, will have to deal with the political declaration. I presume he will look for something around uh, this um, customs, mm -hmm. whatever it is called, in his proposal. And also, perhaps, um, another referendum to clarify the situation. But again, that leaves us here in Europe a little bit concerned on timing right. and, and, I suppose, finalisation. But look, this is hot off the press. We have okay. to wait and see. And let's see what the reaction is tomorrow from the Labour Party leader. Indeed. Uh, Mairead McGuinness, thank you very much indeed. Well, Jacob Rees-Mogg has just described Theresa May's statement as an attempt to overturn Brexit in an attempt to do a deal with the socialists. It is very serious, he said, quote. The Conservative Brexiteer Anne-Marie Morris joins me now from the lobby of the House of Commons. Um, Anne-Marie Morris, it looks as if the ERG, you indeed, have been sacrificed by the Prime Minister on the altar of a softer Brexit. I don't think it's about the ERG sacrificed. I think it's the 17.2 million people who are being sacrificed because what now is on the table, frankly, is simply not Brexit. It's not delivering a leave result um, because what she's clearly looking at 
I think I agree with Jacob, is a, a deal with uh, Labour, which effectively will be a customs union. The reality is a customs union has always been the main starting point in her deal anyway, which is partly why I have always uh, mm. opposed it. But this does not deliver Brexit. Um, and it is something which, uh, frankly, is just unacceptable. This is not responsible behaviour of a prime minister. I expected her at this point, given that we are due to leave legally on the 12th of April, to recognise that there wasn't going to be a deal, a, a mutually agreed point, and that we'd be better off outside negotiating from a stronger right. position. But at every stage, you have miscalculated with your intransigent view about what kind of Brexit we should have, at every stage you've pushed her further into a corner and now she's basically turned round and snapped back at you and has decided to go with the other side. Oh, so I, I think I would uh, hold your fire on that. Uh, we have far from given up. And I think you'll find there are an awful lot of deeply frustrated Conservatives, whichever way they voted on that withdrawal agreement, that frankly will never vote for that withdrawal agreement again. So I would hold your conclusions and just wait to see what unrolls and unravels. There are all sorts of moving parts here. It's partly what goes on in Parliament, and remember, whatever has to get through both houses. Mm. It's partly about Europe and whether or not they will grant an extension. And I think she's a bit hopeful to think that Brussels will give her an extension until the 22nd to avoid European elections. I know they don't want European elections. But we've spent, what, over two years trying to get a deal? We're not going to do that by the 22nd. And if we leave it any later, then we are in uh, European election territory. Right. What you say sounds vaguely threatening, actually, to the Prime Minister, uh, not to me. But um, what are you going to do now? I mean, is the Tory party about to split? No. Are we about to see the split of the Tory party, the ERG, the hard Brexiteers, 200 of whom wrote a letter to the Prime Minister a few days ago saying they would like a no-deal Brexit if it came to that, yep. and the rest of the party. Is that what we're about to see? No, you're not going to see the party split. Think about it. The party is about a lot more than Brexit. And I think one of the challenges for all of us is we need to get this done. No deal, therefore, would have been the right answer. We need to move on to domestic issues. We have to deal with health, education, social but care... But no deal was never on the ballot. No deal was never on the ballot. Uh, yeah, actually, it was. Uh, not on the last one, but on the one before. Uh, on, on the last one... On the referendum one, was... ballot. Oh, on the referendum. The referendum was simply um, uh, leave or remain. Uh, and in terms of it specifically saying no deal, mm. on the remain, it didn't say specifically the terms on which we would remain. Okay. Because remember, you know, Europe is fundamentally changing. Accepting remain isn't about accepting where we are now.